to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in the book of Leviticus, God says, You shall therefore consecrate yourself and be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. We welcome you to our study of the Old Testament books as we're thinking today about the wonderful book of Leviticus. And again, as we mentioned, our study in the Old Testament is designed to encourage us about God, about the principles of God and His dealings with man, and ultimately to point us toward God's way of salvation that started even way back in the Old Testament and is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you today to have your Bible. If you don't have your Bible handy, we want to ask you to find that and have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God today as our only guide and source of salvation. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit them, to come to one of their assemblies. If you'd like to study the Bible, they'd be more than happy to sit down and study God's Word with you about God, about His plan of salvation, and what God expects of mankind. Friend, we want you to know as well that at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in your study of the Word of God also. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of free Bible study material. If you'd like to have a free DVD or a free CD of today's lesson or any of our lessons, you can log on to our website, fill out a media request form, or call or contact us, and we'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. Also, our app is becoming a very popular way of studying the Word of God on the go, both in the Google Play Store and in the Apple Store. Our app is free, and it's a great study tool. Check it out as well, as we're just simply trying to encourage men and women to look to the Bible, God's Word, and to know God from the Bible itself. Today we're thinking about one of the books in the Bible that if we're not careful, we can either overlook or get so caught up in some of the details of sacrifices and things like that that applied to the Old Testament Israelites that we can really miss some of the great messages in the book of Leviticus. Sometimes when people say, we're going to study Leviticus, we think, ooh, what are we going to study in Leviticus that I can really understand? Well, friend, today we want to mention, uh, mention some of the practical lessons from this great book. The key idea in the book of Leviticus is holiness. The word holy or holiness occurs some 87 times. Sin or uncleanness will occur 194 times in this book and atonement or sacrifice some 50 plus times. And so when you think about these ideas, there's no doubt man has sin. And yet God is providing a sacrifice or atonement and through that process, man can be holy just as God Himself is holy. Some of the key ideas or key verses are Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45, where God says to the people, Consecrate yourself and be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. God, through the book of Leviticus, is trying to help His people to be holy. The word holy means to be pure, undefiled, upright, free from sin. How does man who's in sin become holy like God? Well, through the process that God would set forth for them in the book of Leviticus, and then, of course, naturally, through the plan that God sets forth in the New Testament for people today as well. Now, there's a key phrase that we'll find throughout the book of Leviticus, and that is the phrase, I am the Lord your God. 
God will say that 21 times. God wants Israel to realize, don't listen to the nations, don't listen to the heathens, don't let all these outside sources influence you. Rather, you need to realize, I'm your God, I'm your creator, I'm your maker. If you're going to be right and holy and clean, you've got to listen to me. And friend, what a powerful lesson that men and women still, that we still need to hear today. It is the voice of God that matters on these issues. What does the scripture say? Romans chapter 4 verse 3, or in the words of Jeremiah 37, 17, is there any word from the Lord? Let's listen to God. He's our creator. He's our maker. He's the one who can provide salvation for each and every one of us. Now, throughout the book of Leviticus, we want to mention some key ideas or chapters as well in the book. And one of those major chapters is chapter 16. And here we've got what we refer to as the Day of Atonement, or uh, the Jews may refer to as Yom Kippur. And the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16 basically was a way that Israel could atone for their sins. God prepared a an animal, that animal would bear the sins of the people. It would be taken out, as it were, into the wilderness. It would be, there would be sacrifice and blood that would go along with that. And there was a whole process by which the sins of the nation, the sins of Israel, could be atoned for. And when we think about that as a type, there's a lot that goes into that in the New Testament. A day of atonement. The Lamb of God, as it were, taking the sins of the world and, and those sins being placed on Him and, and He atoning for the sins of, of all the people. Isn't that what we find in the New Testament? Christ is the Lamb of God, John 1 verse 29, and He bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And so there's a lot of typology and a lot of it relating to Christ in the Old Testament. Now, you think, okay, Leviticus, where's that name come from then? The name Leviticus literally means from the Hebrew pertaining to the Levites. And thus, in the book of Leviticus, you're going to have God giving instruction both to the people and the Levites, and they were to be the priest that would uh, help the people, that would help them in the offering of sacrifice, that would help during the Day of Atonement, that would help with the feast and the sacrifice, all those things, uh, dealing with sin and how to become holy in God's sight. The Levites were given a lot of instruction to that or for that, and so the book gets its name uh, from that pertaining to uh, the Levites. Now, the theme of Leviticus, as we mentioned, is very simple. God is a holy God. I am the Lord your God. I am holy, God says in Leviticus 11, verse 44. Uh, God does not change. Malachi 3, verse 6. God cannot sin. Uh, the Bible teaches, Hebrews 6, 18, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. And yet, God, who is holy, then we have man, who on the other hand has sinned. How, does, how do God and man become one? How do they reconcile is the question that's being asked and thus through the book Leviticus we find that that occurs in this process God sets forth through sacrifice. A sacrifice for sin is going to be made in the book of Leviticus although temporary and although looking forward toward Jesus Christ sacrifice had to be made. Listen to Leviticus chapter 17 verse number 11. The Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Under the Old Testament, that was the blood of animals. Animals were sacrificed then. But friend, as we think about sacrifice and how man and God are reconciled and man is made holy again, that still occurs through the sacrifice. Not of animals, though but through the sacrifice of the spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And yet Hebrews 10 12 says, This man, Jesus, after it offered one 
sacrificed for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And so as we study Leviticus, there was a separation between God and man. That separation was brought back together, reconciled through sacrifice and the giving of one's life. We find in the New Testament a wonderful parallel. And yet Jesus, the wonderful thing is, every time I see Him, can you imagine living uh, during the time of the book Leviticus? And you sin, or I sin, we sin, and we have to go out into the field, get a lamb or a heifer or something, two turtle doves if we were poor, and offer that, kill them, offer their sacrifice, their blood, that would be burned on the altar and all that would go into that. Can you imagine? And then tomorrow, if you sinned again. Can you imagine what that process must have been like? And yet the wonderful thing about Christianity is Jesus made a once for all sacrifice for the sin of mankind. And His blood completely takes care of the sin problem. And if we find ourselves in sin again, the Bible teaches if we confess, we acknowledge, and we turn from that, God's faithful and just to forgive us. Another sacrifice doesn't have to be offered. We just turn from sin and turn back to God. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And so that's the major theme in the book of Leviticus that we find. Now we want to focus on some more uh, practical lessons. What lessons can we learn from the book of Leviticus that are practical for Christians today? Let's mention some of those in the time remaining. As I study the book of Leviticus, there are several things that stand out that, that, that really ring true uh, for the Christian today. The first is there was a need for a sin substitute or a sin sacrifice. In Leviticus 1 through 5, we will find that for various sins, willful, uh, not willful, sins of various kinds, there was always a substitute or a sacrifice to be made. Something gave its life. Something, something sacrificed its blood and its life for that sin. And it helps us to understand the gravity of sin, but also the importance of the sacrifice. Well, friend, we understand that so clearly in the New Testament. Jesus is that perfect Lamb of God. John 1 verse 29, John the Immerser saw Jesus approaching, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, Peter says, Knowing that we're not redeemed but from our uh, sin by uh, aimless tradition or through uh, sacrifice, silver and gold and things like that, but with the precious blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is that sacrifice, that substitute as it were, that which stands in the place of and made atonement for our sins. Think about this, my friend. When Jesus died on the cross, why did He have to go through that? Why did He give His life for the sins of the world? He did that so we don't have to. Listen again to 1 Peter 2.24. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Who made the sacrifice? Was it a, a bull or a goat or a heifer? No. Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, made that ultimate sacrifice. He bore our sins. He's the substitute, as it were, for sin today. And so a wonderful lesson and practical idea taught there from the book of Leviticus. You know, we also learn another very important lesson from the book of Leviticus about worship, and that is the need to worship God as He's told us. I want you to take your Bible and look in Leviticus chapter 10, and we are going to be introduced to two priests who did not realize the importance of worship, and as a result, there was a great price to be paid. Notice the words of verses 1 and 2. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, notice this, which He had not commanded them. 
So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now God had given instructions to Aaron and to the Levites on how to offer worship that was acceptable. These two men took a, a strange or an unauthorized fire, a fire that God had not told them to, whether it be from the wrong source or whatever it may be. They offered an unauthorized fire, strange fire, profane fire, before the Lord, now listen to this, which he had not commanded them. All right, what did Nadab and Abihu do? Well, they did something that was strange to God, something God had not asked for, something that was not God's way. They did something God had not commanded them. Well, was it really that big of a deal? I mean, it's just fire. They still offered the, they got the incense to burn as it were. Did it really matter that much to God where the fire came from or that it was a little different than what God had said? Well, think about verse number two. Fire came out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord that day. They did something a little different, something God hadn't asked for, and was it really that big of a deal? Here lie the charred bodies of Nadab and Abihu. Ask them. Friend, it was a very big deal. God wanted them to worship Him and to serve Him in the way He commanded. Uh, something a little different, a little strange, a little profane, that which wasn't authorized which God had not commanded, was a very big deal to God. Friend, the practical application is so clear uh, for us today. Does God want us to do what He tells us? Absolutely. The Bible says we're not to add to or take away. Revelation 22, verse 18. We're not to go beyond. What is written? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. We are not to, whoever transgresses and goes beyond the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Uh, 3 John teaches us in verse number 9. And so we realize the importance of doing what God says. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, uh, verse number 15. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And friend, especially as this relates to worship. There's a lot of new ideas that people are trying to bring into worship that we just don't find uh, in the Bible. Things that are foreign to the teaching of the New Testament. Whether that be women preaching in a public assembly which is specifically condemned in the Bible. 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 and 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or be an authority over a man in a mixed assembly. That's not authorized by God. Whether that be bringing in what the world views as entertaining today, drama, plays, skits, a big 10-piece rock band and smoke and lights and all of that. Where's that at in the Bible? Has God asked? For that. And friend, as we look to worship, God's told us how to worship Him. We're to sing and make melody in our heart. Ephesians 5, verse 19, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Where do we find God telling us in the New Testament He wants us to worship in all the various and different ways that we see people doing today that aren't found in the Bible? And friend, someone says, Well, is it really that big of a deal? Again. Ask Nadab and Abihu if it was a big deal where they got the fire from. Hey, it still got lit. Smoke still went up. Incense still went up. Was it really that big of a deal? When they did something God didn't ask for and that was different from what God commanded them, friend, there were dire consequences. We've got to make sure that we worship God according to the Bible, that we do the things God wants us to do in worship, we live in such a uh, feel-good, emotional society that wants to put man and what he wants out in the forefront that we've got to stop and ask ourselves, who's worship? What is worship really about? Worship is about praising and honoring God the way He's asked for. God 
It's who we're worshiping, not man. And we need to do that the way God has told us. John 4, verse 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. God wants us to worship Him the way that we find in the Bible, not according to what we think or what we want. In the book of Leviticus, we learn a lot of lessons about morality and what's right and wrong uh, from the book of Le Leviticus. For example, in about chapters 18 through 20, we will learn that adultery was a sin. We learn that incest is a sin. We learn things like rape and things like that are contrary and sinful to the will of God. We learn that, that homosexuality it, not the only sin mentioned there, but we also learn that in the book of Leviticus, God did not approve of homosexuality. And friend, as we mention all of these, whether it be adultery, whether it be incest, whether it be rape, whether it be homosexuality, friend, we realize that uh, those things are not right according to the will of God. Now friend, we're not saying, as we study the book of Leviticus, on these sins, please understand that whether it be murder or rape or adultery or homosexuality or incest, all of those carried a severe penalty under the Old Testament and they would stone them for that. And we realize we're not living under the Old Testament. We're living under the New Testament. We're not saying or teaching that for any of those sins we needed to take somebody out and stone them. That's not the idea. But friend, as we look to the Old Testament, then as we look to the New Testament, both were sinful in God's sight and today. Friend, we've got to realize that's not according to the will of God uh, as well. For example, look in Levit Leviticus chapter 18 and I want you to see that in the Old Testament something like homosexuality was sinful then and it's still sinful today although we're not going to stone anybody. Look in Leviticus chapter 18 verse number 22. The Bible says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. Uh, look in your Bible in Leviticus chapter 20, and I want you to see the seriousness of this. Leviticus 20, verse number 13. If a man lies with a male, as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. God goes on to say, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon their own head. And so, under the Old Testament it was sinful, and friend, we're living today in the New Testament and the Bible still teaches practices like adultery are sinful, 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11. Murder is still sinful, Matthew chapter 5 clearly teaches that. Rape and incest, things like that, those are contrary to the will of God. And yes, the Bible teaches homosexuality is still sinful and contrary to the will of God. Look in Romans chapter 1. I want you to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 26. Scripture says, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another. Listen, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which is due. We read 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. And of the many things that are mentioned, murder, uh, idolatry, uh, things like unto that, drunkenness, revelry, and homosexuality. homosexuality, God says those people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so it is a very serious sin mentioned in the Old Testament and in the New. Well, what other kind of lessons do we learn that are practical in the New Testament? Friend, we also learn that under the Old Testament, children were to respect their parents. Look in your Bible in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19, and I want you to notice what God says about this in Leviticus chapter 19, verse number 3. God says in Leviticus chapter 19, notice what the Bible says about respecting father and mother and how they were to make sure that they did right in the sight of God and give honor to their parents as they did this. The Bible says, Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. 
And then in Leviticus chapter 20, verse number 9, the scripture says, For everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon his own head. And so upon him. And so as we look to the Bible, it teaches us to reverence and respect our parents. Honor your father and mother. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. There's the same idea. Honor or respecting your parents. Friend, we live in a world where respect is kind of going away more and more. But parents need to be respected. That's something the Bible clearly teaches. A couple of other lessons that we learn from the book of Leviticus is the separation of God's priest. We see that in Leviticus chapter 22, verse 2. God wanted the priest to be separate and to be holy, and there were certain things that were outlined for them there. And of course today, Christians are a nation of kings and priests. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, Revelation 1, verse 6 through 9, 1 Peter 2, 9, we're a holy or a royal nation. Uh, Christians are to be separate. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And then, of course, the main lesson being that we're to be holy as God Himself is holy. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 4, and Peter would quote that in 1 Peter 1, 15 and apply it to Christians. Be holy, for He who called you is holy. And, of course, the way to do that is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Jesus is the only way to the Father. He would say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. John 14, verse number 6. And so, friend, we ask you today, have you made your life right with God? Are you a Christian? These practical lessons that we've learned from the book of Leviticus point us definitely to a need for a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. If you've not become a Christian, we urge you to become one by realizing without Christ, there's no hope. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, He's the only way to salvation. And so just like on the day of Pentecost, when they heard the message, they believed in Jesus, they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. If you've not become a Christian, we urge you to today and study with us next time as we're going to look more to the Old Testament books. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.